afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, congratulations on your show here, on your official opening. Um, I thought I'd start with some basic questions because I don't think everyone in the audience knows you all and knows your practice. I'm hoping if all three of you could just uh, give a little bit of your education background and tell us what you were doing before you found each other uh, together as the uh, propeller group. Uh, my name is Tuan Andrew Nguyen. I actually met Matt during uh, our days at CalArts, during our graduate studies, right? And Matt and I started working together um, as students. We were collaborating with each other on different projects, and then we ended up collaborating with other artists and other, collabor uh, other collectives during our, our time there at CalArts. And um, after I graduated CalArts, I moved to Vietnam to pursue my, my own art practice there. And then I met Funam, and we started shooting videos together. On a commercial kind of side, we were doing television work and film work. But then we also started collaborating on like video projects and more conceptual work as well. So that's my kind of engagement with the collective. Sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> Who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> uh, my name is Funam and I live in Vietnam. Uh, my education background is... is or work background. Work Before background. you were in the propeller group, uh, um, I was a antiques uh, restorer for my father, and now I'm in this collective. I hope I understand. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not good at this. You're doing all right, though. Tuan just intimated that you actually were also doing a little film and video work too, no? Yes. Thank you, Tuan. <laughs> Yes, my name is Matt Lucero, and uh, as Tuan mentioned, we met at CalArts. Um, I guess just to give some background, background like uh, in my personal studies and interests, I, uh, growing up in Southern California and having my art education there, I was really interested in, in what um, art practices were like at that time and the influences that I was sort of, um, I, I was really influenced by a cacophony society and art mark. Uh, Guerrilla Girls and uh, Survival Research Laboratories in San Francisco. So these are all kind of like sort of, um, uh, I wouldn't call them collectives, but they're more like social engaging structures that are evolving or, or something like that. So they were, they were sort of like the, what I would consider like models for where our foundation maybe is coming from. But also um, thinking of the Director's Bureau and, and, and uh, creative sort of uh, frameworks or businesses, because they were a business, like a company, of a collective of individuals, filmmakers, that were making music videos and making um, film. They were and this is in LA, yes? And this is in LA too, so Spike Jones was part of that, Directors Bureau, and, and a lot of other directors, Chris Cunningham. And, and so it was a, this, um, this time where there was a lot of stuff happening in the public space, and then there were these artists, that, uh, creatives that were um, creating their own sort of entities um, to do the work that they were doing. Um, so that's, I would say, like those kind of two things are like really interesting foundations for the Propeller Group and how they, we took those sort of ideas and just expanded on them in, in, in a crazy way. I'm interested in what you say, that you weren't just interested in making work, you were interested in the structures by which artwork is made and how people sort of form into these organizations that allow creative practice to thrive. But I'm also fascinated, as I think many people are, by the fact that you all are practicing visual artists, what we kind of understand in, uh, in a sort of academic way as fine artists, but you've also incorporated as a, a media group in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, tell us a little bit about that process and why, why that was necessary and important for any of you. When I, when I first started working with Funam in 2006, we started to um, make a documentary film about the first generation of graffiti artists in Vietnam. Graffiti is a, a long running thread in our work. And um, we soon realized that it was almost impossible to shoot in public, to film in public without a license. So it was a very kind of pragmatic 
kind of resolution to kind of license ourselves and to be able to like carry equipment out in public to gather images and stories. Um, while we were uh, incorporating, we realized that there were different licenses that we could register under. And at this time in the economic development of Vietnam, advertising was becoming really big. So we soon, we soon realized that advertising companies had much more access to the public space than other companies did. So we, adver uh, we registered as an advertising company. We, had, we knew nothing about advertising. Um, we knew we hated advertising. Um, and that was the irony of, of that move for us. Um, and we've kind of explored that kind of theme uh, since then. Thank you. Um, the biggest irony, of course, of hating advertising is that the show starts with an advert. Um, can someone tell me a little bit about the history of this work, which is called Television Commercial for Communism? So television commercial for communism, um, you know, as Tuan was mentioning, we, we also operated as a production company advertising agency, and we worked with, uh, with real agencies to produce commercial projects, commercial work, um, music videos, also with other collectives and artists to make film work uh, for other artists and with other artists. Um, so we had some connections in that world, in, in, in the world of advertising. Um, and, and media production. So we had some friends at TBWA Vietnam. They have a, a branch, they have a global branches everywhere. And TBWA is a major advertising agency. Um, the early sort of incarnation of TBWA Shiat Day is responsible for the, the 1984 Apple commercial, like the really famous like award-winning commercial. Um, so they're really a, 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 a powerhouse in terms of advertising production. And so we were fortunate enough to have some connections in the agency in Vietnam. And um, we pitched the idea to the agency if they would be up for, uh, um, as if uh, we were clients representing the last five remaining communist countries in the world. And we wanted to rebrand the image of communism. And we proposed to TBWA, is this something that they could help us do as a serious project? Um, and, and it was a complicated project because, uh, you know, TBWA branches can't just take on these sorts of political projects without some prior approvals um, from, the, from the, I think the main office is in London, right? Uh, in, New, in New York? I thought it was London. Well, it, it had to get prior approval from the head office uh, for this project and we thought it, it just wasn't going to happen because it was sort of controversial and um, could be read a, a certain way, maybe, and and we got the approval to do it, and um, uh, we were fortunate to be able to do that and work with this agency, and so we recorded a series of discussions that they had in developing this idea, and it was a, a really diverse group of young creatives, I mean, representing the region, but also there was um, some American uh, uh, individuals present, and it was a, a really diverse group, which is kind of amazing to see. Uh, operating in a creative way in Vietnam, I mean, really at that time and now, and, and allowed to do these sorts of projects. Uh, so, um, man, it's a complicated. It's, it's, well, well, what came from that though is literally sort of products that we see around. Right. So they so they came up with this idea of a commercial, and and the the first idea was that there was a, a young girl traversing the world. And, and she was having these exchanges with different people. And in these exchanges, a smile would be given uh, to her. And she would collect these smiles. And it was a sort of currency. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, she met with a, a group of people in the uh, town hall and distributed these smiles. And it became the new flag for communism. So it was this really utop utopic uh, uh, white landscape. Uh, where uh, multicultural representation of what the world would be like under communism. 
uh, and really uh, the discussions were interesting because um, they were questioning their own sort of interpretation of what communism meant for them and each individual coming from different places had different interpretations so a Malaysian that was uh, you know had a specific uh, under understanding and experience of communism would react a certain way and have a certain definition somebody from the US would have a certain definition and then so it, it was a very uh, complicated starting point and they ended up pointing to the Wikipedia definition of communism so that was the sort of groundwork for what defined this ideology um, and, and they based the commercial and the, um, the manifesto um, on that idea. Um, so in the catalog there's a, a brand bible that a branding agency that we worked with did for communism and it shows the whole development from the logo treatments to the type setting and how the colors are supposed to be used and it's a really serious undertaking it wasn't meant to be uh, facetious or ironic but there's a lot of irony in it um, but it was a very serious study uh, self-study and also a study on how we think about ideologies and the complexities of ideologies and these two coexisting ideologies that we see in Vietnam. Yes, I mean, I think one of the main ironies, of course, is that you use the primary tools of capitalism to pimp communism or make a consumer object out of communism, which is, well, somewhat hilarious, depending on what side of the coin you're standing on. I wanted to talk about some other specific projects, especially the ones revolving around the AK-47 versus the M-16. So this is a running motif through your work. These two guns appear over and over again in films, in sculptural works. Um, so can we start, well, first can we start by talking about these beautiful jail blocks that we see uh, in the room behind this wall? And then talk a little bit about um, why these two guns are so significant for so many projects. Uh, so the jail blocks that you see behind these walls, they're FBI ballistics jail blocks. And what we did was we got an AK-47. It's an assault rifle invented in Russia. Um, and it first saw battle in the Vietnam War. And we got an M-16, which was the US military's response to the AK-47. And we shot those two guns together and collided the bullets inside the jail block. And the jail block captures that fusion, that collision when the two bullets hit each other. Um, the project originated uh, when we were doing our research. A lot of our work actually kind of tries to unpack ideologies from the Cold War. These, these ideologies that have been in conflict for so long and still even to th these days, this day, um, has an effect on our lives uh, internationally. Um, and we were interested in how these two guns, these two assault rifles, have become icons of and in themselves. In our research, we found a very beautiful object in the American Civil War Museum. And it was two bullets that fused on the battlefield. And um, it's a very special object because statisticians say that it's almost impossible, even with that kind of warfare that was happening back during the Civil War days, where like two sides would just line up and like shoot lead at each other. It's almost impossible. It's like a one in a billion chance that two bullets would hit each other in midair and fuse. So we got really kind of connected to that, that potentiality uh, and, and, the, and the possibility of that, what that meant. Um, so what we initially wanted to do was apply that kind of reenactment of history onto the Cold War era and these two, these two assault rifles that have come out of the Cold War. And, but that proved to be almost impossible as well because technologies have advanced since the Civil War days and the velocity of the bullets traveling these days is, uh, it doesn't allow bullets or any kind of metal to fuse, they just hit and they collide. So while we were working with our, um, our engineers, and our uh, ballistics laboratory engineers and stuff, we found this material in the corner uh, and it's a material that replicates the density of human tissue. So this is what FBI, like ballistics experts, use to see how much damage a bullet does to you when it goes through your body. 
Um, so we use that to kind of capture the collision. Um, and it, you know, as you see the work, it, it becomes like a freeze frame of this moment. And uh, that's something that we're also very much interested in as filmmakers to create these freeze frame kind of moments. I think that's beautiful to think about these things in relationship to both photography and film. So on the one hand, they do look like freeze frames, which are photos, and photography was being developed at about the time of the Civil War. So there's a kind of parallel media history that goes along with this conflict history as well. And then you've got this funny film. I want to get into the films a little bit too. Okay, funny may not be the kindest word, um, but a film called AK-47 versus M-16. So all of a sudden we have a move from using the guns rather literally in the jail block situation, um, into this kind of metaphor. Um, would someone like to talk about the film? I have a feeling Phnom does not want to do that. Can I try? Yeah, you may. <clears throat> the film is actually, the main actor is the AK-47 and the other main actor is the M-16. And throughout the film, you would definitely see both actors uh, appearing in almost every shot. Um, and we've combined uh, documentary TV shows and Hollywood films, uh, all the action scenes and drama scenes and made a narrative out of it. So there's an there's a, uh, internet movie firearms database um, that we sometimes pointed to in some of this research and you can search for any weapon and it'll give you the, a list of films and video games where that weapon has been used and, and represented and what years and it's a pretty incredible archive that's maintained and um, it's kind of scary too but not surprising and but also it was interesting um, all of these instances where the AK-47 and the M-16 appear um, it was interesting to when we were researching how much of that actually just came from our own like memories watching these films as a kid and we'd say like oh remember this oh remember that and it's all archived like we we store that subconsciously so a lot of this is about um, in, uh, advertising and how we uh, how, how we're ingesting media and the psychological effects of media and imagery and image making so when you mention uh, the gel blocks as this like pointing towards the beginnings of photography and, and that and and also I, I, I want to point out that there's some really beautiful aesthetics around these objects like they're, they're these really beautiful objects but they're also very violent at the same time and they exist in this this space where both things are sort of happening and you know there's some there's a film called Act of Killing Joshua Oppenheimer's film and it's a it's a really uh, disturbing film and there were some discussions that we had with a friend of ours David Tay about the aestheticization of violence and he said something really interesting that you know a lot of people talk about uh, aestheticizing violence but people don't really talk about the violence of aesthetics and I thought that was fascinating because I started thinking about possibly uh, how how violent uh, or psychologically damaging these beautiful images could be as as well as these horrific images and, and so we're exploring these sorts of ideas in the gel blocks and also in this film is an extreme example of these horrific moments um, because there's a lot of gore and blood and violence but it's all simulated so you really get the sense that like you're watching this simulation, this Hollywood representation and simulation of violence, which is kind of complex too, and layered. And, um, and but it's equally disturbing, even to know that it's represented and aestheticized, and and we ingest it all the time. Well, I was going to say it may be simulated, but it's still quite painful to watch. I mean, I think it's 
not lost on anyone that the metaphor, the words that we use for taking images and the words that we use for, well, killing things are the same ones, we shoot things, right? So there's something about like an image making as sending a trajectory towards someone. And it's not necessarily a friendly gesture all the time. There's plenty of sort of moments and cultures that don't like photography, you know, that don't like being captured in that way. And I think it's important to think about those differences, especially as we talk about sort of working in Saigon and versus let's say working in a place called uh, LA or <laughs> in the US that there are subtleties in sort of the cultural differences of making images. Which brings me to another question before I want to talk about another film work, which is, why are y'all in Ho Chi Minh City? <laughs> where's, where's Ho Chi Minh City? <laughs> um, it's right next to a little town called Saigon. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've been going back and forth on whether to call this specific geographic location Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon. Um, Historically, the, the location has been called Saigon for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And after the consolidation of uh, governments, after the war, the American war in Vietnam ended in 75, the northern government who came in decided to change the name of the city from Saigon to Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and a lot of our conversation has been about whether calling, uh, calling it Saigon could be an act of protest to that kind of dominant uh, narrative that has been applied to that very specific region and those very specific people. Um, I myself call it Saigon. No one's with me? No one's with me here? Um, but I, why are we, oh, why are we in Saigon? I think, you know, each one of us has, has very different stories on how we kind of came back to Saigon, even Matt, um, as a return to, to, that, to the place. Me, personally, I was, um, I wanted to spend time with my grandmother, who was a writer and a poet there, and I never got a chance to spend time with her due to, like, circumstances in history and, uh, you know, leaving the country. Um, for, so for me, it was very personal in, in that way. I was born there, my family escaped, and then I returned there and haven't been able to escape again. <laughs> I was born in Saigon too, and my, my family left as refugees when I was six months old. But uh, my dad made sure that uh, when the doors opened again, we, we came back to Vietnam again. and. My name, Phu Nam, actually means to sort of carry Vietnam, and I felt that was my role, to come back and come back and do something for Vietnam. Yeah, I was born in California, but I sometimes joke that in a past life, I was, uh, so I was Vietnamese, so I feel like, I sometimes say, like, when I came back to Vietnam, and it's kind of funny because I, I was never there, but I, I feel like I had been. But, and maybe it's in a way I'm embodying my father's history because my father, who's, who's here, uh, served in the, in the military and was in Vietnam 1967 to 68 um, in Saigon. Um, so yeah, there's a, a personal connection that I have through my father um, to, that, to that place specifically. Um, yeah. I think that's a really important generational uh, point to make too because my father, who was standing next to your father, oh. was also <laughs> in the battle in Vietnam. <laughs> And so what we all have <laughs> are these kind of imaginations about what Vietnam was. And I think so part of the question I was asking you too is, well, what does it offer your work now to be in that place? The place where for many of us who were raised in the States only exists as the shadow of the war that the Americans lost. And that's the only way we can sort of frame it in our imagination. But, and I have to say that like growing up, you know, I had a specific understanding of Vietnam through the media. And I think that Vietnam is probably the most mediatized country uh, in, in the history of media. And it's probably because journalism was such an important part of the war at that time. That, and, and, you know, we were seeing the moving image in the United States. It was an important part of, uh, of our uh, culture and how we receive information. So it was sort of a transformative moment in terms of how we see things at that time. So, it, it, and what's interesting is that if you Google search for Vietnam, if you Google search Vietnam now, 
the images that come up are from then. That's 40 plus years ago. And Google the most popular chain. Google search that comes up if you start typing in Vietnam is war immediately. Yeah. I mean, this is incredible because you know the Google Archive shifts by the second, right? It's constantly sort of being molded and shifting, but this, there's still this propagation of this imagery that exists even through Google. And I'm just curious about why you know the the, the complexities of that archive, but also why are there no other sorts of representations present. Um, so, so what, as a second sort of generation from our parents, right, and, and, and the, res, the, the sort of, uh, we grew up during the time when it was the, the sort of end of the Cold War and experiencing like sort of the, 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 this dissipation, but it was still present, this tension that's still present and even present today. Um, I, I think that a lot of our work is about that because we're sort of ex still experiencing that and have experienced that, but also we have this direct connection because of our parents and our parents' histories and we're affected directly because we're a part of that history. That kind of uh, unfortunate representational archive that still exists is what makes things like the AK-47 versus M-16 even possible as a film. But I'm also interested in these other images of Vietnam that you guys are producing as well. and. Um, most significantly, I think, in this exhibition is a beautiful film called The Living Need Light, The Dead Need Music, which is about a kind of contemporary look at Vietnam, but through its uh, funerary practices. Can you all walk us a bit through that film? Um, for those who haven't seen the film in the back room, it's called The Living Need Light, The Dead Need Music. Uh, the title of the film comes from an old Vietnamese proverb that kind of explains the kind of approach to celebrating one's life through um, celebrating their death. Um, and a lot of the, the ceremonies and the rituals that kind of are um, brought into these celebrations um, are kind of fantastic. They're, they're, they're beautiful kind of acts of like death-defying um, actions. Um, there's a lot of music, a lot of celebrations. Some of these celebrations could last from like two days up until nine days I heard from someone. Um, and they're very public. Uh, and because the way that the, the houses are kind of situated in Vietnam, there's a very thin kind of barrier between public and private. Um, people kind of live in public. It's, it's, a, it's a very street-oriented culture. And so when these funerals happen, they're, they start inside the home, but the home opens up out into the public and the doors are open and people can come and celebrate with the family. Complete strangers will come and celebrate with the family. You drink, you eat, um, there's bands, there's um, a procession that happens. And it's one of the reasons why we got interested in this phenomena is because the transgendered and the transvestite communities take this opportunity to come and perform in public. So it becomes an area of like protest and resistance or something like that. It's very amazing. And um, they come and they, they dance and they perform. And, and because it's such a ingrained kind of ritual in Vietnamese society, the government doesn't do anything about it, which is, which is makes it into this very kind of complex and, and beautiful space. Um, and where was I? Yeah, so, so that's where we kind of got inspired to kind of make this film. So the film follows uh, several funeral processions in the southern part of Vietnam. And we traverse a lot of different landscapes there. And it very much, is very much similar to the landscapes in New Orleans. And some of the, the, the rituals and the music and the processions kind of overlap with some of the second line kind of traditions in New Orleans. Um, and that's why I think, you know, when, when, when the film was released in Prospect 3, New Orleans Biennial, people, uh, it, it grabbed people's attention because they didn't know where they were in the film, in this filmic space. Yeah. That's a beautiful phrase because not only do you not know where you were, but time moves in a weird way throughout the film. And I'm wondering if I can ask a technical question, which is, um, how do you work with time and speed and the kind of tone of films? Because um, the slowing down, the speeding up, this kind of two tracks of time working uh, simultaneously in frames is a, is a motif through several films. And can you speak to that a little bit, just as filmmakers? 
So there's a technique that we use when we make music videos sometimes, and um, you shoot over crank, so you film at a higher frame rate, so when you bring it in to edit, the footage sort of slows down and the lips are still in sync. So it's this trick that filmmakers sometimes use, it's, a, it's an aesthetic uh, sort of trick. And we've applied that to our film work, um, specifically the Living Need Light, the Dead Need Music. So um, we, we like to consider it a sort of music film. Um, and there's a moment where it's sort of, you're, you're lost in the music, there's, there's a music, uh, a full song that's in the, in, the, in the middle of the film. And it sort of becomes a music video. And we sort of thought of this as a music video. I think our approach was, um, was you know, looking at it through that, through the, through the lens of, of commercial producers producing a music video for the, the band or the, the, you know, the, the person who was leading this procession um, as an homage to the work that they do, as an homage to the workers that are performing, uh, also as an homage to the people that have passed away. And maybe, you know, what better way to, homage, to, to have an homage to somebody is to make a music video for them. Um, and, and Go for it. Yeah, um, I think it was really important to us because a lot of people, when they see the film, it's, it's very easy for a film like this to fall into the category of being exoticizing um, because, because it's so fantastical and some of the imagery is so rich and, and the characters are so unique and special. But it was very helpful, I think, you know, in our commercial work, how we approach different subjects. Um, in the commercial world, we, we call them clients. Sometimes they're pop singers. Sometimes they're like brands. And I think we, we brought that into this work. Um, and the approach of making a music video of these people, celebrating these people's labor and their presence and their actions um, and their performances, we approached them as if they were pop stars. They were kind of heroic figures in this like landscape, marching through the landscape. And, and I think that's a lot of, yeah, I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I think people enjoy the film so much. And, it, and that it doesn't fall into that kind of very um, problematic kind of ways of looking that exoticize the subject, I think. I have a follow-up question to that film, and I actually want to open it up to the audience, but I have one more question for you, myself, and that is, we're also celebrating your death with this project as well. So I would love for you all to explain that a little bit, because the book in particular opens up with an obituary to the Propeller Group. Um, they're not dead, y'all. They're sitting right here. <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is time, moving in two different levels right now. Can we talk a little bit about um, the propellers now? <laughs> First of all, RIP Muhammad Ali. Um, major, major character in our histories. Um, we are not dead ourselves up here. We will be eventually, so as will all of you. Um, so we think, just culturally in Vietnam, death is a part of everyday life. There's always celebrations of death. Um, not only in regards to like the, the funerals that are happening in public space and you pass them on, on your way to work, but it's ingrained uh, in how people, people live. And, and death has become, has been such a big part of Vietnamese history because of the multiple wars over multiple, multiple thousands of years. Um, I think, you know, death has been a recurring theme in, in a lot of our work. Um, AK-47, M-16 piece kind of has, touches upon a very kind of existential kind of uh, idea um, about existence and death. Uh, the living need light, the dead need music is a very kind of direct kind of exploration of the ceremonies in which we, 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 we make to help prepare ourselves for death. Um, but there was a question about our death, right? Sorry, no. Why is there an obituary? Oh yeah, who wrote that obituary? <laughs> was it you, Funa? No, um, one of the opening pieces in the book is an obituary to the propeller group. And it talks about the mythology of dying and ways of 
I think the, the obituary was a way of a different approach to thinking about death and existence and the act of being a collective and as compared to being an individual artist with your own individual practice. Um, yeah. Matt, did you? Uh, I, oh, well, it's, that's, a, maybe, that's a tough question. I think maybe we, we all have sort of leanings towards Buddhist philosophy as a, I think we can all like say that, uh, agree with that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, maybe, um, how did that? I, th I think we also kind of take this idea of reincarnation as a metaphor yeah, or yeah. as a strategy, um, and we apply it to like image making. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> I want to die to be reborn. Yes. That's what Muhammad Gandhi also said, right? But the short of it is you also take it very seriously. It's a metaphor, it's a celebration, but you actually consulted someone who gave you a new birth date. And so you sort of, I saw a small kind of funerary like ceremony for you and a literal reincarnation ceremony. So the propeller group, in order for better chi, has been reborn <laughs> just in time for this exhibition. <laughs> Are there any questions for, from the audience? Yes. The question for those of you who may not heard it was a question about the collective practice. Um, do they each have individual marks on the, on the works or do they sort of think as an ensemble? Yeah, I think we definitely approach things subjectively. It's impossible not to and have your own sort of ideas and thoughts about specific subject matter that we're dealing with. So we each bring something very unique when we're discussing the, you know, I, the idea, or the, the foundation of a project. Um, it might come from a specific place, like Tuan was mentioning the, the Civil War fusion, the bullets, and then it sort of, you know, gets unpacked with research. Like we came across a Mythbusters episode where they tried to replicate the Civil War bullet, and then we get you know, sort of obsessed with myth busting the Mythbusters and working with the ballistics lab to do that. And um, so, you know, I, I think it's a, the process of collaboration isn't always so clear. And it's, it's, it isn't always so clear where things, sometimes it is though, um, but, but uh, as things develop, it gets more layered and more layered and more complex. And, and uh, I think that's the beauty of working with other people is that um, if you're, you, you allow yourself to be open, um, unexpected things can happen. And um, it, it takes the project potentially to another place that either one of us, if we would work on that particular project, might not take it to that place. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the way that you began in responding to and then how you sort of create this on top of that as maybe as this critique of, of representation of the things. So I guess the question to you guys is, is everything an image? I think you all heard that. <laughs> Leave it to Lon to ask the hard questions. <laughs> I think the, the... Yes. I think we... <laughs> I think we start there. I think we start there. Um, I think we originated in that space, believing that everything is an image. And I think... And maybe this goes back to your question about the obituary and about death. Um, we're invested in exploring the possibility that the opposite of that question. That maybe images, that, that the narrative doesn't have an image sometimes. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, it, that everything isn't an image, but possibly everything is a narrative. It has to have a beginning and possibly an end. Um, and maybe that's where we're headed, I think, I hope. Does that make sense? There's also an interesting, um, you know, Tuan mentioned um, looking, 
And I think um, looking as a lens and you know, how our mind interprets what we're seeing as a form of image making, um, I think is interesting because as filmmakers and, and commercial producers, we're, very, we're highly aware of like shifting lenses for different clients, as Tuan was saying. Like we might shoot something specifically for Coca-Cola that we wouldn't normally do for Superflex or Dinkule or, or, or somebody else that we're working with. So we sort of can switch our lenses depending on our subject matter, the end goal, who we're working with, um, what we're trying to achieve. And I think that ability to change lenses gives us different perspectives and allows possibly the viewer to see things differently, which is a, a, you know, a sort of reaction that we're getting from the film is this, uh, you know, a different way of looking at a, a subject matter, a representation of that subject matter that, you know, that is also a critique of ethnographic filmmaking and documentary filmmaking and just photography and, and the colonial act of making an image. Yeah. And I think sometimes when images don't have a narrative behind them, then they could be really problematic or they can be used in problematic ways. So I think, you know, the narrative is, all, is something very important to us. But speaking of narrative, when we talk about images, we're also talking about information and how it relays something, whether it be factual or fictional, to its viewer or to its uh, audience. But we've talked as a group a lot about mythology. And, and so I'm fascinated by this interest in mythology, but this interest in the way images carry information or may have to be counteracted in some way. And, and as a follow-up question, you talk about like this move between fiction and, and mythology versus fact or history or something of its representation. Yeah, that gets a little more complicated when you're dealing with objects, especially historic an antiquities. Right. And so, and then there's carbon dating, there's like all these processes that one goes about to, to figure out what, you know, what value that has. Um, the, yeah, so, so that's an interesting thing to think about too. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything about antiquity. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're very kind of obsessed with this idea of mythology and creating stories, recreating stories around objects and around different histories um, other than the dominant narrative. Um, and, and I think a lot of, we try to do that in a lot of our work. We try, we attempt to. Um, like the film AK ver AK-47 versus M16 is, is a way to kind of unpack all the images that we've seen growing up since the Vietnam War, since like the AK-47 and the M16 first saw each other in battle, um, and then to repack it into a different narrative um, that, that exists in our head, you know? Um, and when you watch the film, it's going to be very traumatizing for you all. So don't watch the film. Don't, don't watch it. So in, in, in repacking that imagery, like Tuan was saying, and re-editing, like we're, we become complicit in, in, in the same ways that the industry is creating these images, these really, you know, uh, traumatic and damaging uh, violent imagery. Um, so I think that's interesting too, is that you know, I, I think in the work that we're doing, we're not uh, separating ourselves from uh, the act of making. Um, I, we put ourselves in the act of making, which makes, a, makes us complicit, but also gives us a, a, an opportunity to sort of uh, push and pull things, you know, both sides of things. So um, I think that's a, it's, it's, it's difficult at times. Like editing this, I, I feel like I'm contributing in a way and I don't want to be a part of that, but it, it also gives me a different perspective in allowing me to think about things differently um, and rethink about like these existential ideas and the way that we've sort of ingested these images over time and, and the, you know, the place that we live in now and the place that our children are going to grow up in the future. So it's, it's really complex. We have time for one more question from the audience. Yeah, 
how you're sort of navigating and deploying or avoiding functionality. Uh, and the possibilities of being uh, For those of you who couldn't hear, the question was about a work called Fade In, and Fade In is a video work um, by which a conversation between a producer working with the group called Tung is talking to a FedEx custom agent, um, and the FedEx custom agent basically withheld the shipment of objects that had been left had left Vietnam for a TV production project, but somehow was absconded on the way back into Vietnam. The question in particular was how much of this was real, how much was this based on uh, real activities, and how much is this? Uh, uh, how much of this is uh, trying to avoid being overly didactic about, if I'm quoting correctly, overly didactic about, let's say, cultural. Can I say cultural uh, preservation, cultural value, and authenticity? Is that a fair? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this film was a reenactment from our conversations with customs agents in Vietnam. So, so based on a true conversation. And, um, and uh, the conversation ended up with the customs agent suggesting to us what we should do for an exhibition, just a general overview. And so the, the, the shipment, the, the movement of the wood pieces that you see in that film fade in, ultimately went to an exhibition very much like what you see here. And this was shown in Vietnam. Um, so that's the Originally, the intent okay. was to ship back objects and props that we had created in Vietnam for a television miniseries made in Vietnam about porcelain from uh, a historical museum in Holland. So when we shipped it back to the historical museum in Holland, it became Dutch national treasure, even though there were really cheap props like fake wooden guns and they were like wooden lighter guns that you'd light your cigarette with um, and like fake swords and, and fake like Dutch like costumes from the 18th century. So when it was marked as Dutch national treasure, historical items coming back into Vietnam, it was given a different value. And this idea of value kind of plays, plays out throughout this, this conversation we had. And in the end, we were surprised um, the only thing, the only thing that we changed in the, of course, we, we rewrote our, our experiences. Our re, it's a, it's a reenactment. The person that we had a conversation with wasn't the FedEx customs guy. It was a customs guy from national security. It was a government guy. Um, and that's the only thing that we kind of like switched around, but we, we try to write the conversation as close to our memory of that conversation as possible. So what does it tell you in the end, this conversation? She didn't have a mic, sorry. Everyone's a curator, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Potential. Well, like I said, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting, like people surprise you and, you know, the, the way people value objects and put value on objects um, is, is interesting and that's something that we try to call into question and even we get surprised sometimes. And I think that's what, the, the, for us, the humor of the film is in that moment where it, it kind of turns back on us. And we're, yeah. You get schooled a little bit. Yeah. Um, thank you for schooling us on your work and on your practice. Congratulations again on a beautiful exhibition. And for wonderful work, we look forward to what's next. Thank you all for coming and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>